Hello, friends, and welcome to Colliding Worldviews. Today is Monday, April 3rd in the year of our Lord, 2017. It's a blessing to have you back again after a couple of long weeks, uh, very busy weeks that we had for the first International Apologetics Marathon of 2017. We hope that that was a blessing to you, and many of those shows can now be found on the Trinity Channel's YouTube channel. Any shows that are missing should hopefully be there soon, so please take those shows, take the URLs, put them on Facebook, put them on Twitter, anywhere else, uh, other social media sites that you use, and also get the URL from the videos themselves and just email them out to people, because there's a lot of people who don't use social media, and getting those links will allow them to get that information, which everybody needs. As you know, there's no other channel that you can turn to to see international apologetics marathons where about 70% of the shows are on Islam. And of course, we do many debates as well. We just had a debate with Usama Dakduk and Yusuf Ismail out of South Africa on is ISIS a true representation of Islam? It was a blessing to have so many people tuned in watching the live shows and of course now seeing all these videos on YouTube as well. And now uh, back to a regular weekly schedule, at least for the next six months, because the next International Apologetics Marathon will be happening in September of 2017. So please stay tuned for that. But like I said before, these weekly shows are continuing. And we want to let you know, too, about ABN's new digital tree. If you're not aware of it, you can find many different channels now that are all being fed to you through the different platforms that we're on. There's smart TVs, there's Apple TV, Amazon Fire Stick, Roku. The list goes on and on. Of course, we're still going through satellite to the Middle East, North Africa, Australia, and New Zealand. And of course, through high-speed internet to trinitychannel.com, as well as all of these different devices that people can use, like Apple, Android, and so on. So thank you for praying for ABN and the Trinity Channel, and thank you so much for your financial support. Your ongoing gifts allow this work to continue. It allows all these weekly shows and, of course, the great marathons that we do with all the great guests. Now, today, again, we are not part of the marathon any longer, but I do have a fantastic guest today who I do want to introduce to you. And this is a very timely topic. This is a very, it's going to be a very informative show that you definitely want to inform people about because people need to be aware of what is happening in other countries around the world, especially when it comes to Islam and the Islamic worldview of, of having an end goal, an end, uh, an end game of having the world under Sharia, regardless of how soon or far away from now that is. That is the goal, and we see it happening slowly, a little bit by little bit by a little bit more each month, each year, we see it happening in countries around the world. And today we are looking north. We're looking north of the United States because we are looking to Canada. And my guest who I have here on the show is Sandra Solomon. Sandra was born a Muslim in Ramallah and raised in Saudi Arabia. She then went on to change her name and she moved to Canada where she converted to Christianity, an act that her family, of course, roundly denounced. Sandra is the niece of the late Sahar Habash, one of the founders of the Fatah party and a member of its central committee who led the second intifada of Pal Palestinian suicide bombings against Israel. Sandra, thank you so much for your, um, how, I'm just thank God for how brave you are. Thank God for you and for all that you're doing over there in Canada. Welcome to Colliding Worldviews. Thank you. Uh, God bless you and I'm honored to be with you. It's great to have you on, and I'm, I'm really excited to have you on, Sandra, because your story and what has been happening up there, I have been posting stuff on social media, on my personal social media pages about it, ever since I saw the video of you standing up at a, a public uh, committee hearing or school hearing about what is happening with the schools in Canada, and I think that is really one of the videos that, that put you on the map and let people uh, know about you and what you're doing. And we, again, just thank God for you and your work. And I want to let our audience know about what you're doing and how they can be praying for you, what they can be doing to help you, regardless of where they live. But first, I want to take a quite a few steps back because you actually grew up in Saudi Arabia. And I think it'd be very helpful to let people know what life is like in Saudi Arabia, because many people hear about it, but they don't, <laughs> they have, of course, no personal experience. So I want to take, take a, a, a quite a few steps back, and let's start with your growing up there and just make our way 
uh, to the present time. And of course, we do want to give a, a, a chunk of the show uh, emphasized on Canada itself. But what can you share with our audience about Saudi Arabia and growing up there and what you experienced as a female growing up in Saudi Arabia? Okay, yes. Um, I grew up in Saudi Arabia since I was uh, nine years old. Uh, so basically, uh, we studied uh, in the uh, Saudi um, Saudi Arabia is governed by a hundred percent Sharia law constitution. Uh, so uh, most of the subjects in the schools uh, influenced by the Islamic teaching, which is the Quran, the Hadith, uh, which is the says and the, uh, what Muhammad said and what Muhammad uh, did, and also like uh, many other uh, subjects on Sharia law and also memorizing the Quran. And so basically in a daily basis, uh, mainly the Islamic uh, subjects. And uh, as we grow like a little bit of other subjects, like an Arabic language, a little bit of math, a little bit of uh, uh, geography, even the history, it's just the Saudi history, not a, like a really concentrated uh, subject or very broad subjects as well. So uh, that's what, where I, uh, how I grow in the schools and uh, as a girl, uh, well, it's it's very difficult as a girl, as a woman in Saudi Arabia because uh, since we are young, we are forced to wear the hijab. And as we grow uh, a little bit in a mid-school and high school, we are forced to wear the niqab uh, the, to fully cover our faces as well. So these uh, are the first things that make me start to rebel against Islam is the hijab and the niqab. And also... Uh, I can uh, like I face uh, so much of uh, like a uh, persecution in the schools uh, regarding of me always rappelling and questioning the Quran and especially when I was in high school because we uh, we used to study like a subject uh, the psychology and uh, me uh, I was uh, attached to it and I loved it and I used to read the books that they teach it in university as well uh, so I was uh, very much of uh, critical thinking and anal uh, analyzing so when I did uh, like assignments and I was always uh, questioning the teacher about the God of Islam or the book itself the Quran and uh, when I did the big assignment to prove to them that the Quran it's a man-made book and it's also the God of Islam has a psychological issue so whoever write this book has a psychological issue I face mm -hmm. so much persecution and uh, uh, as a woman in Saudi Arabia, women as a second class citizen, not just because they are in Saudi Arabia, because also Saudi Arabia govern 100% Sharia law. So uh, it's not like I study Islam only. I lived Islam. I lived under Sharia law and I experienced firsthand how is it um, harm and uh, oppression uh, for women and humiliating as well, because we are a second class citizen. We have to have a guardian like a husband, father, brother, a male, who's uh, called in Arabic muhram. He is the responsible about everything uh, for the woman. She's not allowed to leave the house without his permission. And uh, many men also, they marry like uh, uh, multiple wives. They have two, three, four wives. And uh, also, the um, they're not even till today, they're not even allowed to, to drive a car. Uh, so basically, they're so, supposed to submit to Allah, to Sharia Allah, to Muhammad, and submit to the husband and stay home, and unless the husband give them the, the permission to go wherever and to do whatever, without permission, she cannot do anything. Uh, me, as I, I grew up in Saudi Arabia, I did not have an ID. We did not have ID. We, I did not have a bank account. We always need to ask the male to give us the money or for, for him to take us. Uh, whatever we want to go and buy whatever we want to buy. So basically it's a hundred percent controlling uh, No freedom of speech. No freedom of thoughts. Uh, you cannot criticize Islam. You cannot criticize Sharia. You cannot criticize the religious uh, uh, Authority, uh, especially when we used to go I many times I would start refusing to go with my family to the market to the mall or whatever because of the religious uh, Sharia police they hit the woman if they are not covered they hit them with a stick if they are not covered uh, um, very well. Uh, so it's fully control. It's like slave, slavery. I felt like I'm being, I'm, I'm in a slave camp. I did not feel like uh, anything. Uh, I feel humiliated. 
uh, I felt I'm oppressed. Uh, I need to get out. I need to breathe, especially when it's really Saudi Arabia, the weather is so hot, it could be 45 degrees with the humid and we have to cover our faces. Like yeah. to the point, uh, I feel dizzy if I want to put it, like I cannot breathe. Yeah. So that's basically how I grow up and I studied the Quran. I used to memorize almost half of the Quran uh, until the high school, basically until I start to uh, rebel uh, against it um, in, in, a, in a stronger, uh, I would say, um, actions. Like in the beginning, in my mid school, just you know, whatever. And but in high school, basically, was the time where I was rebelling against them, like um, uh, harshly. I used to question them. Uh, I did not want to submit. I fight with the teachers. One time, I threw the Quran in the teacher face uh, because she refused to let me leave the school without her, without me uh, covering my face 100%, not see through. And uh, I faced uh, so much like at home. Uh, physical abuse like my father my brother and many times when we used to go visit my grandma in Jordan I wanted to take a break from the hijab my brother uh, attempted to kill me uh, many times like an honor killing because I uh, take the hijab off uh, so I faced uh, lots of uh, persecution uh, because of my actions and because yeah. of me yeah. rebelling and questioning and not wanted to submit to Sharia law now, Sandra, we see how so many people in Saudi Arabia do obey the laws, at least outwardly, because they don't want to be punished by the Sharia police. But the mindset that you had, where you were actually questioning the religion of Islam, questioning the Quran and all that, um, how common was that amongst your classmates when you talked with them like on a one-on-one -on -one basis, although they probably didn't share that uh, publicly, how, how prevalent was your mindset amongst other youth in Saudi Arabia? Uh, actually, I was the, the only one. And uh, I remember the mid-class and the high, high school class, like because as well of my action. And especially, I used to love music and arts. Uh, so uh, many girls will be mocking me and, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's giving me all these um, books of uh, Islamic, you know, the how to mm -hmm. repent, how to submit to Allah, other Islamic books that uh, they want to bring me to Islam. I feel, you know, they're preaching Islam to me. Many girls are brainwashed with it. And uh, most Muslim women around the world, not just Saudi Arabia, are um, fallen into this uh, psychological syndrome called Stockholm syndrome. They have a lot of psychological uh, problems because they think and they believe this is the way this is the, the it should be this is uh this is good for them uh, because uh we they grow up in the mentality where they uh, they told us that oh you are like a candy you need to be covered if you're not covered like your meat is not cheap for men and if the candy who's not covered the 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 flies will come on it like representing the men so to protect the women from any sexual assault, verbally or physically, or not to be raped, they have to wear the burqa, they have to cover themselves. So many women actually believed in that, believed that if they do this, uh, and if they submit to Allah and to Sharia Allah, uh, that's how she will be like a good Muslim. She needs to be a good Muslim woman toward uh, Allah and toward the Sharia. And uh, she needs to submit. Without submission, she considered... Um, uh, like uh, she could be a, pla a blasphemer uh, and, and blasphemy law in Saudi mm -hmm. Arabia it's punishable uh, by uh, many ways you know by either being killed or crucified or flogged or many ways or being jailed there's so many ways so uh, yes I was the blasphemer and many girls at the school they tried to um, they say, uh, take take me back to the right path, al sirat al mustaqim. They call it Islam. Is the right is the straight path, uh, the only one and straight path to heaven. And uh, the Quran, it's it's a final word if it's from God. And uh, Muhammad, it's his messenger. And I, but I did not buy all that. Maybe some girls like you know, especially the one um, who's not native Saudi. I would say Syrian or Lebanese or Egyptian. Uh, we are being called foreign in Saudi Arabia. Some of these girls will be like a little bit more, uh, I would say, liberated uh, from other native Saudi women. But still, uh, many of them, 
they will still like also like uh, follow the Sharia law and do whatever uh, they've been told because the spirit of fear, they are afraid. They are either afraid from the school, the government, the force. Of course, first of all, they're afraid from Allah. They fear God mm-hmm. and uh, the spirit of fear because Islam, I, I noticed that uh, it's controlling people by the spirit of fear. And many girls, they fear also to be killed if they commit anything. They fear their brothers, their husband, their fathers, um, anyone in the family, any male, the guardian, to kill them. Because and under Sharia law, whoever um, did the honor killing, if she brought shame, if she got killed, the, the male will not be punished. He won't go to jail. It's actually the opposite. He will be celebrated. So if a, a woman does not cover herself fully, then rather than blaming the male for committing a crime, quote unquote, they just completely blame the female and they say, well, you brought it upon yourself because you weren't covered enough, right? Exactly. If the girl, she got raped, let's say if she's not fully like covering her face or she has a, uh, her face uh, open and she's wearing makeup or whatever and she's you know, like a little bit of, uh, you know, openly talking and in, in the mall and whatever. If she got kidnapped and raped or anything can happen to her. Uh, yes, um, even if she had a, like a, a boyfriend and she commits uh, adultery with him, they will not uh, punish the boy. They, they will punish the girl only. And even also if she got kidnapped and, and raped, uh, they um, they punish her because she was raped, not because the man like it's totally the opposite under Sharia law. It's always a female. Um, the, the problem is the female. It doesn't matter. The male always sit free. Always. Whatever he do, even if he uh, not even killed her, like even if he just uh, physically hit her or beat her up, uh, he, he it's from the Quran. A male allowed to beat up his wife. It's under Sharia law. It's halal. It's okay. Uh, they're okay to uh, the marital rape. It's halal. It's okay if the woman refuse um, to give her husband uh, the sex. If he force himself into her, it's okay. Uh, she she cannot uh, claim this as a marital rape. So and again also if if she refused to wear the hijab and the niqab, like uh, similar what happened to me i was physically abused a lot like beat me up my brother used to beat me a lot like uh, severe uh, severely and um, uh, many times he t- attempted to kill me just because i uh, if it wasn't for my grandmother i would have been killed for sure and also now, sandra they threat- there are many they countries that around they're gonna the world throw acid on that their are... faces. i'm sorry go ahead I'm... because the threat as well of the throwing acid on the face that's why also they covered because they're okay. afraid if they keep the face open, they might, someone uh, might throw acid on their face and burn it. Wow. Now, Sandra, there are many countries around the world that are under Sharia, but Saudi Arabia is under the Hanbali, named after Ibn Hanbal. Um, what can you share with our audience about what makes Hanbali, the Hanbali school of uh, uh, the Madhab uh, unique compared to the Hanafi uh, Maliki and the Shafi'i. To me, it's all Islam. I don't, I don't look at Islam as a madhab. You know, the Hanbali, the Shafi'i, the Maliki, and all these. Uh, it just uh, branches for the same. It's the same problem. And I looked at Islam at the source of the the core of the problem is the Quran and the Hadith. So mm-hmm. nothing really uh, much different. To me, it's nothing not different. I, even if it's a uh, they say, oh, uh, to, according to our madhab, uh, we do we do this, but the other madhab they don't do that. But the other madhab they have a, another problem too. Like it's not doesn't mean any madhab is better than any other madhab. Mm-hmm. It's all same. And they all say that the Quran is the highest source of authority yes, under their madhab, but, even though there are slight differences between the schools. Correct. Uh, yeah, but uh, this is the, uh, the our um, confrontation or confirmation oath that we have to give it in school all mm-hmm. the time in Saudi Arabia that uh, since they are very young, since they're like a daycare age, they, they teach the kids uh, that they have to repeat it all the time. Islam, it's our religion. Uh, Quran, it's our constitution. Muhammad, it's our prophet. Jihad, it's our way. And dying for Allah, it's our ultimate dream. This is repeating every, almost every day in school. This is the oath that we take in school. 
We have to repeat and, it. We have to repeat it. And that sounds exactly the same as Hassan al Banna's uh, motto for the Muslim Brotherhood, which began in 1928 as well. Yeah, the same. Nothing different. Quran is their constitution. Every Muslim on the earth, they believe that Quran, that's the Quran. I always carry it to show the people. That's the Quran. This is their constitution. That's the government here. They don't govern by Canadian law or U.S. law or any other law. This is the Sharia law constitutional book. That's I call it. That's that's I call it. This is their true name of the Quran. It's the Sharia law constitutional book. That's the government here. So whatever they don't want to govern by Canadian law or U.S. law. They want to govern by this book. And to them, this is the final message from God. And each and every human being on earth should submit to this. And if they're not going to submit, you, they have a three option. It's either to be killed or either to um, bait the jizya. Sorry, if it's either to submit first. If they're not going to submit, uh, it's either to be uh, to bait the jizya uh, for, for the Muslim. Okay, so submit or bait the jizya or you're going to be killed. So and it's only the Jews can, and the Christians okay, and who really get that coffee? third choice for the dimitude, right? Sorry? It's just the Jews and the Christians who get that third choice of being a, dim, a dimmi, correct? Yeah, the dimmi is uh, a little bit uh, different. But overall, at uh, the end of the day, there's another passage that's the same. Because we don't take only the Quran, there's a hadith too. And then we look to the Syria literature and we find that all of these countries that are under Sharia, they are looking to the same sources. So even though there's slight differences, as Sandra has said, they're all looking to the same man, Muhammad. They're looking to the same religio-political system of Islam. And Sandra, I want to ask you how growing up under that, how did you manage to leave Saudi Arabia and get to Canada where you are now? Uh, when I uh, finished uh, the, my high school, I went to Jordan. Um, I stayed at the, my grandma house. At that time, my brother was the guardian. My my dad was uh, extremely busy traveling, and uh, I well, I came from a broken family. I did not have my mom at that time. Uh, they were divorced uh, many years, and uh, so I lived with my my grandma and my brother was the guardian. And because of my rebelling against. Uh, you know wearing the hijab I don't want to wear the hijab I wanted to continue my education so uh, because of my attitude uh, they um, they end up uh, I was house arrest uh, uh, for a, a couple years until um, my dad uh, forced me into a marriage I was forced into marriage uh, also in Saudi so I'm back to Saudi Arabia um, and then uh, through my ex he was the he applied for Canada, and I was uh, I, I was like um, you know he did the sponsorship. It's a through him. That's how I get to come to Canada. So praise God. At okay. least you know uh, he used something evil for good. So my marriage was forced um, almost to five years. Um, I, I struggled a lot with the marriage. Um, I was not married. I was raped almost for almost five years. And uh, I got a child, and it was hard for me to uh, gain my divorce. It's a long battle, long story. I suffered a lot between Saudi Arabia and Jordan, traveling between here and there for uh, me by myself. No one, no one is fighting with me. Every time I would just talk to my dad and talk to my family, they forced me back to him because uh, that's it. I, if I would divorce, I'll bring a shame to the family. It's a culture based on fear and shame. So um, I would have to submit to the husband and all that stuff. So anyway, um, I managed to uh, come to Canada after I gained my divorce and got my Canadian documents. Um, I escaped there and I came to Canada with me and my child. And a person may think, well, coming from Saudi Arabia and now being in Canada uh, would pretty much seem like the Baskin of, of freedom compared to Saudi Arabia. But Sandra, yes. since you have been in Canada, what have you noticed happening there that is beginning to slightly remind you or resemble Saudi Arabia? Uh, and and what, what can you let our audience know about what you're seeing that's happening in Canada? 
Okay, uh, when I first uh, came to Canada, I came 2005, okay? Uh, uh -huh. In the beginning, I was busy with my own life as a single mom with a baby uh, with me. Uh, I, I am not focused into anything, just me and my son and to get myself um, to, uh, to build my life, right? To stand on my uh -huh. feet, to be uh, able to um, take care of myself and take care of my son. But later on, years, uh, especially uh, when uh, Justin Trudeau got uh, elected, uh, I start to notice right away, rapidly. Like, of course, slowly, slowly, I've seen things, you know, in between. Before that, I've been seeing, like, um, the number of hijabi women are increasing in the malls. Uh, lots of um, halal uh, food stores, a lot. Uh, basically, many, many restaurants. Uh, like the halal certification on the, at the door, uh, look, or or there, like to, for for people to know that it's a it's a halal certif uh, certified the food, even if it's uh -huh. not Muslim, it's a, maybe it could be a Chinese restaurant, but have halal certificates. These kind of small things start to um, you know uh, got my uh, attention uh -huh. uh, until the time where uh, Trudeau got elected. Uh, I start to see it uh, like it was like a big big shock to me when I saw him like uh, surrounded with all these uh, uh, Muslims and one lady she um, give him her baby uh, and she said oh we elected you because we know uh, my child is gonna be free and and all that so many talking it's look like it sounds all Islamic to me and then all of a sudden um, they, the decision to bring in all these huge massive number of uh, immigration which is I call it invasion uh -huh. and uh, the number after that the number is going crazy rapidly I'm seeing lots of women not just the hijab they are wearing the whole black uh, the abaya the cover the, the niqab it's exactly what Muslim women they wear in Saudi Arabia I, I see it here in Canada and uh, lots of lots of hijabis and lots of women with lots of babies each and every woman, minimum five kids uh, with her. And uh, and on top of that, I start, well, before that, um, I was doing a little bit here and there, like I do the street preaching. I start doing uh -huh. a street preaching, okay? Uh -huh. And uh, on the street, I would see uh, lots of Muslim um, talking to me in a very aggressive way or mocking me or persecuting me verbally and uh -huh. uh, saying, oh, this is... Uh, uh, this is the religion of Allah and, and everyone will submit and Canada will submit and all that stuff like they're talking to me as if they're sure about it. So anyway, uh, which is, yes, as an ex-Muslim, I know the ultimate goal for every Muslim in the whole world to uh, build the caliphate and to bring back uh, the at the time of Muhammad to spread Islam. Uh, but uh, it was I was shocked, like how fast is it? And uh, uh, for me, it started to open my eyes to tell people the truth about Islam until the uh, government start to give the accommodation for the kids in the school to give them a Friday prayers. And not only the prayer, the khutbah also, the sermon before the prayers, mm -hmm. they allow them to do that. And it hits my, uh, it got my nerve. Uh, I went to the school board and uh, I stood up against that decision and I told them the Quran, it's hate literature, should not be in schools. They're going to brainwash your kids. And I had evidence in my hands as well. I wanted to give it to the school board, but they refused to listen to me. And they, uh, by force, they brought the police and the security. They, get, they took me out of the, the school board. I was so upset and so mad. Because uh, as an ex-Muslim, I grew up in Saudi Arabia, 100% Sharia law in mm -hmm. schools, in Saudi Arabia schools, we did not do any prayers, nothing, zero. I never prayed in school. We never have any special room, like I would call it a small masjid or a special room for the student, for the girls to do the prayers. Never. We never prayed in school. Because I also I know under Sharia law, you know the f uh, the five um, prayers time, uh, uh -huh. the morning and the noon and the afternoon and the maghrib and the isha. 
uh, under Sharia law, it's halal. It's permissible if someone uh, pray the noon the noon prayer and the afternoon prayer together. Combine them at once and do it. It's halal. If someone driving, traveling somewhere, he cannot pray or she cannot pray, they can wait until they go to the mosque or to the home and combine them together. So it's not a must for Muslim to, to pray like sharp on time. And uh, so that's what drives my crazy. I see the taqiyya, the deceiving. I see the lie in front of my eyes and I could not keep it uh, quiet longer. And I uh, spoke about it and I will continue speaking. So Sandra, you as being someone who grew up in Saudi Arabia and experiencing Sharia firsthand and living underneath it, uh, I'm, I'm sure, I, I just told someone yesterday who I was talking to about this and talking to them about the Muslim Brotherhood and the political Islamists who actually, who obviously um, have a different method of operation and aren't doing exactly what ISIS is doing. That's why ISIS winds up on the nightly news. And the Muslim Brotherhood and the political Islamists do not because they have a different method of operation that they go about on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis. They're actually much more patient than the jihadists, but they have the same worldview, they have the same end goal, and unfortunately, the jihadists are a distraction to people from the what's happening behind the scenes. As you're seeing the slow Islamization of Canada, as you're seeing this creeping Sharia, what are you, letting, what are you telling people who are not knowledgeable about Islam, what are you telling them that is maybe getting through to people where they're kind of starting to realize what you're saying and seeing how these different things are being imported into Canada slowly as, as time goes on? Well, first of all, they need to know that every Muslim, every Muslim on the first of the earth they're not, according to Sharia law, they're not supposed to take um, the Christians or unbelievers um, allies until they're doing taqiyya. It's halal in Islam to lie and deceive. That's called taqiyya. So, and especially the imams, the leaders. And my uh, focus now in Canada is the imams, what they preach in the mosques and uh, the Muslim organizations. And that's exactly how Muslim Brotherhood infiltrated the system. As you said, people are distracted by the physical bombing, jihad, the killing, all that. They think that's the only one way and one form of jihad in Islam. But they don't know that there is many ways of jihad. And these Muslim Brotherhood, uh, they come, they sneak, and they take, uh, they, they, uh, control politically, political Islam, because that's that's the whole point of Islam. It's a political. Before I go further, I want to tell each and everyone that when I criticize Islam, I don't criticize uh, like as a religion, because uh, Islam, it's not a religion. We need to call it for the way it is. Islam, it's a political um, political agenda. Uh, to uh, to take control and to take over and to make each and every one in the country to submit to one and only rule is the Sharia Allah uh, coming from the Quran and the Hadith and uh, from the founder of Islam Muhammad. So uh, that's uh, that's the whole point. Uh, so for them to be able to do that, they have to sneak. Especially they want to do the civilized jihad, uh, uh, in a, like what happened with Ikra Khalid, the Muslim Pakistani. Um, and being the liberals and uh, she brought the motion M103 and is basically calling each and everyone who says the terrorism it's uh, it's Islamic considered Islamophobe Islamophobe so mm -hmm. they're bringing the Islamophobia motion and they pass it and basically now it's, it's still like a study and uh, once they got it um, they, they are like on the way on the process mm -hmm. for them to make it a law. So this one, if it becomes a law, that's 100% Sharia law, blasphemy law. So after that, they will take a legal action and persecute each and every one. They're going to be quilled. That's the word. They want to quill them. They want to silence them by force. 
any kind of force. They could be jailed, they could be charged, they could be fined, they could be anything, anything and everything. So, and uh, so that's that's the danger of the Muslim Brotherhood, and they come and they sneak also through government through Muslim organizations. That's what they do: organization, organization, organization. And in Canada, as a secular country, uh, each and every one individuals or whatever group of people they are legally they can do their whatever organization they want, non-profit, profit, it doesn't matter. the The law it's oh, it's not illegal, right? So they do it uh, this way to deceive people and they bring it uh, in a um, deceiving way. They play nice, they play, um, you know, moderate and whatever, but behind the doors, they're actually laying the ground for more the Islamization for the movement to, to and they play victim card. They play yeah. victim. Yeah. That's, that's the main that's the core of, of, of the main point. They focus always, always blame victim. And in each and every Muslim in the world, in their mentality, they believe that they are a victim. We grow up with it. As a Palestinian, yes. At a certain point of my teenage, yes. I believe that we are a victim. And the Jews and the Christians, they hate us. They will never be, uh, uh, they will never love us or they'll never be, a uh, friend with us until we become we leave Islam and we become one of them and um, so they grow up and the Jews are our enemy we have to kill them they are filthy they occupied our land the Christians are helping them so many 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 points that they bring in the Muslim mind the victimhood you know they then they're very good at it they blame victim because they believe that they really they are victims there, it's a psychological problem as well. Like whatever Muhammad, the whatever psychological problem that Muhammad had, it's passed on to the Muslims. So sometimes I advise people, if you don't want to study the Quran, okay, study Muhammad, the founder of Islam. Mm -hmm. And people don't realize that all of these, this, this mindset and the hatred of Jews, it all goes back to Muhammad himself. And Sandra, you know there's a whole lot of people out there who are completely ignorant of Islam, and they have a Muslim friend or a neighbor or coworker who lives a completely peaceful life, and they're thinking, oh, that's Islam. But I, I say all the time, I say, look, I said, your Muslim neighbor who you love does not define Islam. Muhammad defined Islam 1,400 years ago. And if people want to know about what Christianity teaches, we say, okay, we'll read the New Testament, <laughs> read the words of Jesus himself. Now, if we want to know what Islam teaches, we need to look to Muhammad. What did he say to do? What was his life like? And a lot of people aren't doing that. They say that it, this is, uh, they want to, to, to fight discrimination against all religions, but then all of a sudden they put Islamophobia, you know, at the top of the list there, like, oh, Islam's getting special treatment. Now, Sandra, do the, do the people there these politicians who are enacting these resolutions and all that stuff, do they not realize that they are actually just implementing aspects of Sharia upon themselves by saying, don't offend a Muslim, don't criticize Islam, don't criticize Muhammad, uh, or are they, just, are they just completely ignorant of it, or are they just going along with the agenda, not knowing the the end goal and how <laughs> they're not going to, they're going to pretty much be in a world of hurt themselves when they actually live under Sharia? Of course, uh, to them, it doesn't matter. They got the power, they got the seat, they got the money, they got the, uh, you know, the, the control. They, they, you know, there's a, it's two reasons. It could be they know and they're going along with the agenda. They don't care. Okay. And also, uh, it, it could be they are ignorant and they are uh, not knowing exactly how danger uh, the teaching of Islam. Uh, but uh, overall, I can see it, uh, whatever I see from uh, Justin Trudeau and his government. Uh, no, I would say uh, the Canadian government, they know. They know all of them. They know exactly what Islam wants and they know exactly that this is Islamization. And they know exactly, and they're going along with the Muslim Brotherhood agenda, and they're actually helping them and working with them. I'm sure 100%. Now, why would they do that if they are not Muslims themselves? Uh, how do we know? 
uh, jihadi Justin Trudeau, he uh, goes to the mosque all the time and gives them special accommodations and and always uh, like uh, there's many videos uh, for him like praying and saying the shahada and all that stuff. How do we know he did not convert to Islam? Well, he could be. It seems like most people who use the term Islamophobe are usually Islamophiles. Or they are faxophobic because they don't they don't know about history. They haven't studied the life of Muhammad, and they don't they don't study the the, the hijra from Mecca to Medina and how many Muslims today are following that same pattern. The worldwide ummah is moving throughout the world to have an Islamic presence and fill the mosques that are being built around the world. And uh, Sandra, it's, it's just a blessing to have you on because you know you as someone who grew up in Saudi Arabia has, of course, a different perspective than uh, a person like me who grew up in the West and is just studying and trying to say, hey, this is what it's like in the East. But what would you like to tell everybody um, in America, You know, people who maybe have never even been to Canada, they don't know exactly what's going on there, what would you like to tell Americans about what is happening in Canada and what Americans need to learn from it? Uh, first of all, uh, I want to uh, thank the Lord Jesus Christ uh, for Donald Trump and uh, God bless uh, USA and God bless Americans. And uh, I want to warn them because Canada, it could be um, it could uh, it could be uh, like a, what do you call it? Um, a danger a neighbor, like uh, laying ground for more jihadists. Uh, mm -hmm. It could be in the future. I want to uh, tell them to keep your eyes on Canada. And uh, Canada, it's not going in a good direction. Canada, uh, it's been Islamized very, very rapidly and very quickly. And uh, many illegal immigrants now, the one who left U.S., they're coming, uh, crossing the borders uh, without check. And uh, many also are coming uh, from Syria and through the opening the doors for every uh, uh, immigrant without uh, screen check on them. So Canada, it could be a uh, lay ground for many uh, a jihad attack against the USA one day. If they're not gonna uh, work with us uh, hand to hand uh, toward this uh, serious problem and protect the borders. They need to protect the borders. And, um, and also, I want them to open their eyes about the danger of Islam, the Islamization of, of uh, U.S. as well, and also uh, to uh, expose Islam for what it is and uh, search the imams. That's what I'm doing now in Canada. I expose the Canadian imams who speech, uh, who do the hate speech. Um, we expose them and also uh, grow more in knowledge because knowledge is powerful and they need to listen, not just me, anyone and everyone who's warning them about the danger of Islam and I'm openly challenging all the time I open challenge for every Imam even the top Imam in Canada Dr. Iqbal al nadvi Ekna Canada he is the top Imam and even the top Imam in US I'm willing to challenge the, the top Imams to prove me wrong in my claim yeah. and uh, they need to hold them accountable the US uh, citizens they need to hold each and every imam in the U.S. and each and every organization accountable of uh, their action, of what they're saying, and, uh, and imply the law on them. If anyone doing a hate speech, report them, uh, take them to the court, and expose them. And uh, work uh, along also with the police, with the forces, uh, to protect, because at the end of the day, the jihadists, they don't uh, recognize the law. They see, yeah. they, they want to destroy the U.S. law. They want to destroy the Canadian law. That's why they're bringing the motion. They're bringing the bills one after another. They're bringing these motions one after another. And they're not going to stop because the ultimate dream for them is to dominate, dominate, dominate and build the caliphate. Islam do not believe in borders. I always repeat it and I will continue to repeat it. Islam do not believe in borders. Islam wants to dominate and to take over and to slave them. So they need to be careful. They need to be aware. They need to protect their kids and especially uh, in the schools not to be um, uh, brainwashed with the Islamic teaching 
if uh, if you see your kids coming home with any Islamic text, Quran or any Islamic book, uh, take it from them and uh, educate yourself about Quran and educate your kids about the Quran, about the teaching of Islam for them not to be brainwashed. And also help the Muslims uh, to understand because many Muslims as well, like they are brainwashed. They don't know the true face of uh, Islam, especially the one who, do who doesn't speak Arabic, the Pakistanian the Iranian, the European, they don't understand the Imams are controlling them. It's the mainly it's the Imams we need to focus on them. And of course, they don't understand the gospel either. They don't understand the good news about the Lord Jesus Christ. And Sandra, that's why I thank God for you, because you are a perfect example of the fact that God loves Muslims because you used to be one. And now you've realized the truth of Jesus Christ and who he is and his death and his resurrection and how he is much greater than Muhammad. <laughs> and I know we do shows about Islam all the time here. Um, but people need to not only look to Canada and what is happening there, but if they want to get a, you know, a five, 10, 15 year, um, uh, maybe premonition of what Canada has the potential for, all they need to do is watch my show with Tommy Robinson called the Islamization of the United Kingdom, because the United Kingdom is, you know, 10, 15 years ahead of America. And of course, America can either learn from the UK's mistakes or we can follow in their footsteps. And it's the same thing with Canada. You have the UK here, you have America here, and now you have Canada probably, you know, about like, you know, right here or so making its way up and the slow Islamization. And the only way that we can really combat this, like you said, is to make people aware, educate people about Islam, not the Islam of your neighbor necessarily, but the Islam according to Muhammad. How did Muhammad define Islam? Now, of course, we don't want to um, encourage the moderate Muslims out there to live more like Muhammad. It's a good thing that they don't live more like him, but we need to, we need to educate people about Islam defined by Muhammad, and we need to love our Muslim neighbors. And of course, I'm sure you know, Sandra, there are a lot of people in, in Canada, there's a lot of people in America who are intimidated by Muslims, they, they don't want to talk with them, they don't know what to say, and they need to see them as people who are made in the image of God, and who people who need the gospel. And I, I would think, Sandra, that on average, the, the, the Muslims out there are more prepared to hear the gospel than the average Christian is ready to share the gospel. And we need to encourage uh, Christians to talk with Muslims, don't be afraid of them, but be knowledgeable about Islam at the same time. Now, Sandra, what are you doing currently in Canada? I know you're, you're going to a lot of events, you're doing rallies. I want you to let our audience know about what you are doing and also about some upcoming events that you would like to let them know about. Yes, uh, before I go uh, into that, uh, you mentioned something um, uh, very important, uh, which is uh, the church and the Christians. And what I'm seeing is uh, we should not always blame the Muslims. We need to actually blame the Christians and the church and the church leaders who are quiet about Islam, who is not educating mm -hmm. the, the Christians and telling them to encourage them to rebuke the spirit of fear, because the spirit of fear is not from the Lord. Anyone and everyone uh, can do it. Uh, it's not a rocket science. And mm -hmm. um, the Lord will give them the wisdom and by the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, they can speak. And when I do the street preaching, I'm sorry, I say it to the Muslims all the time to their face. You are the children of Satan and the will of your father. You do. He was a killer from the beginning, because if we're not going to also be openly talking to Muslims and to uh, to a Muslim, they need to be shocked somehow because they're not here physically here, but mental their men, their mind. It's, it's uh, at the seventh century at the time of Muhammad. Yeah. They don't belong to, mentally. They don't belong to this world. And um, at the 21st uh, century, and they need lots of healing, spiritual healing, uh, mental healing, psychological healing, because they've been brought, brainwashed with so many things. And also we also in a spiritual warfare, not a physical. I don't want to see also Muslim getting killed uh, or Muslim bombing themselves or a Muslim kid in, 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 uh, from the, in the West Bank going to the Israeli uh, uh, civilians and, and with the knife and being shot. 
like what happened uh, not too long ago, 17 years old uh, boy. He was uh, encouraged by the imams in the mosque to go. So he got the knife and he went out and he got shot dead. So that upset me too. I don't want to see also Muslims getting killed. Uh, yeah. Because as you said, they're being created in the image of God and we need to bring the gospel, the good news. And a very important word that many Muslims are deceived by it is the word Tawheed. The word Tawheed. They believe mm -hmm. that they are the one and only human being on earth worship the one God. They don't know that we don't worship the cross. We don't worship the three gods. We are not a, a, like a, a polytheist. So they mm -hmm. need to know the message of Tawheed. It's actually us, the Christian. And uh, Canada and U.S. And UK and all the Western civilization was founded in the Judeo-Christian values, which is a totally, totally the opposite of the Islamic values. That's what we need to keep in mind and to tell the Muslims and to preach them the gospel, to evangelize to them, because at the end of the day, um, Jesus said, you are the light of the world, you are the salt of the earth. And if we're not going to be the ambassadors of Jesus Christ, Lord of Lords and King of King, and this, this dark time, who's going to do it? So my encouragement for every Christian to pray for church revival and uh, for the church to be clean from the false uh, teachers as well. There are many false teachers in the, in the church. And uh, we need to uh, pray for that too and the church revival. And uh, as one of my uh, uh, best friends, uh, Dr. Costa, said, He's also apologist and uh, he teaches yes. the Bible and, is, and Islam. He also goes always for debate. He said uh, a wonderful thing always, ex-Muslim make a good Christians. So yeah. and that's the truth. And uh, many, many, many thousands of Muslims are actually uh, leaving Islam every mm -hmm. day. Even if it's not in the news, the media doesn't talk about it. But that's the truth. Many Muslims now are leaving Islam in Middle East when they see the true face of Islam. We should not stop. We should not uh, be afraid. We should not be, uh, you know, submitting to whatever politicians they're doing. And we need to clean our governments from the betrayers who turn their back on their people. As in Canada now, we have a government who fighting us, not fighting for us. And uh, that's what the people need to do through Europe, through Canada, U.S., everywhere. They need to clean the government, Australia, everywhere. They need to clean the government from the... Uh, especially also the UN, so many, uh, uh, you know, they 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 uh, they betrayed and they don't care. It's the globalism, the Marxism, and whatever all these isms that trying to control people by it. the communism. So many agendas. It's not just Islam. They they all work together toward one goal. Uh, it's uh, to uh, take over and to make people submit to them. My activities now and what I'm doing now is. Uh, I start a civil political revolution. Uh, it's going to be the first week of uh, first Saturday uh, of every month and um, across Canada. And uh, people are rising because without a revolution, nothing will change. Without people are breaking through their fear and leaving their comfort zone and come out from the closet uh, that they're putting themselves in it with all these barriers that the governments they put on people, which is the political correctness, okay, and the fear, oh, I don't want to offend them, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do that, should I say this, should I say that, that it's not going to work, you need to say the truth the way it is, and uh -huh. uh, I'm my encouragement to everyone to break through all the barrier that the governments who betrayed their people to break through it and not to be intimidated by it, and I do the rallies, and uh, I started uh, as well this uh, year, July 1st, Canada Day. I started and it's going to be internationally uh, every year. It's going to be International Burn Hijab Day. I have a video on YouTube. Anyone can go watch it. Um, make July 1st International Burn Hijab Day. Uh, to stand as a sisterhood, I'm, I'm also calling on all the true feminists, the true ladies, the true... Um, uh, you know, who, who care about the women's rights, also the women's rights activists, the women's rights organization, to stand 
uh, as well against Sharia law because women are number one victim uh, from the Islamic teaching and they are deceived and many young girls under age marriage and uh, we have here imams in Canada preaching uh, the under age marriage like we have Toronto police Muslim Khan he said it marrying nine years old is permissible we need to go after these people and to make sure that we need to apply the law and force the law on them because whatever whoever trying to or thinking that they're going to be above the law it should not work we have the Canadian law or we have the US law we keep the law where we need to immune our system and immune our constitution from any infringe or anything that has uh, anything to do with the Sharia law. Uh, we, we should not replace the secular, democratic freedom of speech with something coming from the 7th century. It's not going to uh, work. Uh, we're going to have a clash. We're going to have civil war. And uh, we need to avoid this. At the end of the day, I am against violence, even toward physical violence, even toward the Muslim. But when we speak, we speak the truth. And uh, we need to stand together. And I'm doing these rallies. And also, um, I'm going to Israel. And I'm going to be doing also tour talk in Canada to educate people about uh, Islam and share with them my experience living under Sharia law. Well, Sandra, thank you so much for being on the program. I do want to encourage our viewers to connect with you. They can connect with you on Facebook, you're on Twitter, and also your new website, which is still under construction a little bit. That is voiceofsandrasolomon.com. That's V-O-I-C-E-O-F-S-A-N-D-R-A-S-O-L-O-M-O-N.com. People can check that out. And also people can actually donate through your website to help your cause and the work that you're doing. But friends, please follow Sandra on Twitter. Please uh, send her a friend request on Facebook or now. Once people get 5,000 friends, you could still at least follow them. So you'll still get the posts that they make. So if nothing yeah, else, they, follow Sandra on Facebook, for follow the her donation, on Twitter. They can go to buyisrael.ca, buyisrael.ca. Okay. So another website, and then again, voiceofsandrasolomon.com. And yeah, I mean, people need to realize, Sandra, that America, at least, was founded on a, it was a constitutional republic. We have freedom of speech. And what we're seeing in Canada, what we're seeing in other countries is a clamping down, if not a complete doing away with freedom of speech. And when people say, say what you want, but don't offend people, <laughs> they don't realize that, okay, you are now muffling freedom of speech. Because Freedom of speech is to protect speech that people don't like. You know, when you give, if I say Sandra, that, that's a great outfit that you're wearing. Uh, Sandra is not going to get mad at me because it's a compliment. <laughs> she, she agrees with me. But when we give someone a compliment or when we say something that somebody likes, there's no complaint. They're not, they're not mad or anything like that. It's only, people only get upset when you say something that they don't like or they don't agree with. But that is exactly where freedom of speech comes in offensive speech, speech that people don't like, is the exact kind of speech that needs to be protected and defended. That's what the free, that's what freedom of speech is all about. And Sandra, I hope that the work that you're doing up in Canada uh, bears much fruit, not only in letting people know about the history of Islam, the theology of Islam, and of course the end goal of Islam, but I hope that more people realize this and that more people get behind you, that more people support you, that more people or become more knowledgeable about Islam and, like we said, reach out to their Muslim neighbors and love their Muslim neighbors just as God loves Sandra, who's a former Muslim. He loves people who are still Muslims and need the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Sandra, uh, thank you so much for being on the show. And for all of our viewers, this video will be available on the Trinity Channel's YouTube channel, so please get the link and share it on Facebook, Twitter, other social media platforms, as well as through email. And, Sandra, Again, I thank God for you and for your work. May the Lord bless you and your work and give you a hedge of protection as you're out there on the front lines, uh, not only exalting the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, but making people aware of the true nature of Islam. Amen. Thank you so much, and God bless you, and uh, bless the show, and bless the channel, uh, the ABN Sats. Uh, God bless you all. 
and uh, great work and we keep going and we're gonna keep uh, spreading the truth and saying the truth the way it is because Jesus said I am the way I am the truth I am the life and uh, no man and no woman can come to the Father but through Jesus hallelujah to that amen Sandra I will talk with you soon thank you so much for being on Friends, thank you so much for being with us on Colliding Worldviews. Again, this weekly show that airs live every single Monday is here because of you, because of your prayers for ABN and the Trinity Channel, and because of your financial support for ABN and the Trinity Channel. So please continue to support us, allow this work to continue. This is not just on high-speed internet and on Apple TV and Amazon Fire Stick and Roku and all those different platforms. This show is being streamed live through satellite to the Middle East, North Africa, Australia, New Zealand. There are people throughout the world who are watching it on many different platforms. So thank you so much. Please pray for us. Please support us. Allow this work to continue. And all the other weekly shows, another one coming up tonight. And, of course, Islam on the News on Fridays, The Cross and the Crescent on Tuesdays. And, of course, we still have the prayer show happening on Thursday. So please stay tuned always to ABN the Trinity Channel. Thank you so much for being with us. And we'll see you next Monday on another live episode of Colliding Worldviews. Thank you.